Welcome, alumni. I'm Jillian Ordicelli, and uh, I'm here today to welcome you to our reunion, celebrating the classes ending in the zeros and fives. On behalf of the Alumni Association Board of Directors, I thank you for joining us for this, the first installment of our reunion. I'm wishing you all health and safety as we navigate these challenging times, and I hope this program will be a welcome respite in your day. I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, a jurist who needs no introduction, Justice Luby Harper. Justice Harper is a member of the class of 1975. He is the first African-American alumnus of the Yukon Law School to serve as a justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court. A former leading public finance lawyer and a community leader, Justice Harper currently sits by designation on the Connecticut Appellate Court. We have the privilege today of hearing Justice Harper present his keynote address, America in Crisis, an Assault on the Rule of Law in Our Democracy. Justice Harper. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, fellow alumni, colleagues, friends, and members of the University of Connecticut Law School community. It is indeed a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to address you this afternoon as we bear witness to a novel online reunion celebration. I must note that I am immensely honored to recognize and proudly celebrate the recent appointment of UConn Law School Dean Ebony L. Nelson. This historic appointment of Dean Nelson as the first African American to be appointed Dean on a non-interim basis, and only the second woman to hold the position, is a testament to what is possible, especially for women. We would be hard pressed to think of someone else better suited for the position during these challenging times than Dean Nelson, a Harvard Law School graduate and former Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Professor of Law at the University of South Carolina School of Law. Dean Nelson and I have met, and I can tell you without hesitation that she is the right person at the right time to shoulder the awesome responsibilities that fall on her shoulders as Dean of our beloved law school. She is someone who wants to be impactful and who understands the importance of scholarship and public service. She understands the challenging facing legal educators, law students, and the legal profession. She understands that challenging times afford us a unique opportunity to be creative and bold, to think outside of the box. She understands, among other things, the importance of creating and maintaining a more diverse and inclusive community for the law school's faculty, staff, and students. Yes, I'm convinced that her personal life and professional experiences coupled with her global perspective, will serve this esteemed law school well. As someone who has always championed rights for women, I must acknowledge that this year marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, an amendment that enshrined in our Constitution the right of women to vote. This right not only allowed millions of women to participate fully in our democracy, but it also brought women a step closer to equality in all aspects of American life. So I cannot tell you how satisfying it is to see women, particularly women of color, ascending to positions of prominence, power, and authority. 
this phenomena is a welcoming manifestation for what is possible for women in a nation that has discriminated against them based on their gender. Just recently, we witnessed the rise of Senator Kamala Harris, the former Attorney General of California, who was selected to run as Vice President of the United States of America. Her presence, poise, and eloquence gives me great hope, hope that we certainly need. As Senator Harris herself once said, and I quote, don't give up. Our country needs you now more than ever. This is a pivotal moment in the history of our country. Our ideals are at stake and we all have to fight for who we are. We are all and should be treated equally. Close quote. Senator Harris made that statement in 2015, and five years later, we remain at a pivotal moment in the history of our country. However, I believe the situation in front of us is far more troubling and dire than it was in 2015. You see, America is in a state of crisis as we witness an assault on the rule of law and our democracy. In fact, the year 2020 surely will stand in history as the most challenging year for our nation. This nation was beset with an alarming rate of unemployment, a sagging economy, issues associated with policing, climate change, protest marches, rallies, acts of violence, looting, destruction of property. And of course, we have COVID-19 and its relentless march through our communities. It bears emphasis that COVID-19 has ravaged communities, particularly communities of color, where resources are already far short of what is available to those from more affluent communities. And shortly after COVID-19 completely upended us, the pandemic of racial injustice reached an apex, launched by the death of yet another black man in custody. Yes, America is in a state of crisis. And I am deeply concerned by the state of affairs in our country. I'm concerned by our national politics, a dysfunctional Congress and the lack of any moral authority and leadership from the upper echelon of our national government. I'm concerned by those elected officials who take an oath to defend the Constitution and who nevertheless violate that oath by valuing self-interest in partisan politics over the rule of law, our democratic principles, and the general welfare of all Americans. I'm concerned by those elected officials who use their office as a bully pulpit to personally attack and insult individuals who disagrees with them. I'm concerned by the display of hatred, the move towards isolation, and the drift towards autocracy. I'm concerned by the debasing language used to describe certain groups, the caging of innocent children, the lack of reasonable gun control, the pervasive amount of gun violence, and the senseless death of so many innocent people, particularly by weapons of war. I'm concerned by the blatant use of gerrymandering and other suppression tactics to dilute voting rights. I'm concerned by the assault on the truth, the discounting of science, fear mongering, implicit and overt racism, and divisive rhetoric 
flowing from the mouth of our so-called elected leaders. I'm concerned that these issues are dividing us as a nation and encouraging some folks to be less tolerant and accepting of the diverse populace of our country. These issues raise serious questions and present many challenges for our nation. They lead us to question our fundamental principles, to question whether we are a country that includes or excludes. They speak to our moral compass, to our democratic values and to who we are as Americans. These issues inherently implicate the nature of our democracy, questions of diversity and cultural inclusions, questions regarding the rule of law, peaceful protest, and police accountability. Yes, police accountability is a hot button issue, an issue that those of us in the legal community cannot ignore. I completely understand and support fair and effective law enforcement. The police bear an awesome responsibility to keep us safe and secure. This is a challenging responsibility, one that is demanding and at times incredibly stressful and dangerous. I know and am friends with many dedicated, professional, humane police officers who understand, respect, and honor their oath of office to serve and protect all of us. As a father and grandfather of two African-American men, both of whom are police officers in the southern states of Alabama and Texas, respectively, I am personally aware of the stress that the dangerous nature of policing place on law enforcement officers and their families. The police play an important role in our towns, cities, and states, and they need the necessary resources to do their job, while at the same time partnering with those they protect through goodwill and community policing rather than with the unnecessary use of military armor and tanks. Police officers are vested with a sacred public trust, a solemn oath, and when they violate that truth, or when they violate that oath, or sacrifice that trust and abuse the rights of others, they should be held accountable. Failure to respect one's constitutional rights or the unnecessary use of abusive tactics or deadly force can understandably result in the ferocity of anger and frustration that flows from the deep well of racial injustice that this country has harbored too long. George Floyd died at the knee of a police officer who apparently had no respect for the rule of law and viewed himself as judge, jury, and executioner. This tragic public execution ignited an expansive national and international protest, highlighting worldwide opposition to police brutality and racism. A few months later in August, I watched on television a police officer in Wisconsin shoot a black man in the back multiple times. For what? What on this earth justifies shooting someone multiple times in the back? Surely there was a better way to resolve this matter or similar matters before resorting to the use of lethal force. Force which inalterably results in a damaged life social upheaval, protests, and all too often chaos. The need for national leadership during these difficult times is so vividly apparent. And yet when I look for leadership, I see a vacuum, 
or a wholly inadequate or insensitive response. Yes, it's clear to me that America is in a state of crisis as we near the last quarter of 2020. The events of the past year have been disturbing, made all the more challenging by the truly insidious pandemic we now face. The effects of the pandemic have reached all facets of life and all classes of our society. Temporarily, we hope, life has been changed for all of us. This upheaval presents a myriad of challenges, challenges for our society and our democracy, an attack so effective that it would impress our most ardent foreign enemies. After all, do they care whether our demise is inflicted by them or whether it occurs due to internal strife, so long as the end result is the same? the destruction of our democracy. The democratic experience is complicated and its continued existence requires allegiance to the rule of law. Our forefathers recognized this and thus crafted a foundation buoyed by principles and institutions that would check the use of power by those who are governing and thereby inspiring confidence in those who are governed. These principles are found in the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution. The essential element between those who govern and those who are governed is the supremacy of the rule of law a principle that has sustained this country since 1776. It is a concept that can be found as far back as ancient Greece where the philosopher Aristarco once said, the only stable state is the one in which all men are equal before the law. And therein is the crux of the rule of law that every single individual will be treated equally, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, religion, creed, or any other categorical designation. It matters not whether you are wealthy or poor, you are to be treated equally under the law. And when we live up to that principle, that sacred ideal, we sustain our government and concert with the continued consent of the people. Our history teaches us that we have endured many struggles to protect our democracy and the rule of the law. Young men and women have died on battlefields to protect our values. And civil rights advocates have been whipped, beaten, hung, and murdered. And most of the time, our leaders have united rather than divided us, such as with the words of former President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who once said, and I quote, the clearest way to show what the rule of law means to us in everyday life is to recall what has happened when there's no rule of law, close quote. It should not surprise any of us that this former commander of the Allied forces during World War II established Lord Day in 1958. This observance, still observed by many in our profession, carries a powerful message for it is a day of dedication which recognizes the important principle of government 
under the law. A necessary principle for sustaining the viability of our democracy. People who do not value the rule of law or people who are willing to stand silent and observe the drift towards autocracy are complicit, complicit in a crusade that will inevitably undermine the rule of law, destroy our democracy, and guarantee inequality and injustice. Those people would have no respect for the paradoxical words yet laudable objective of the renowned and former United States Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, who once stated, and I quote, a child born to a black mother in a state like Mississippi has exactly the same rights as a white baby born to the wealthiest person in the United States. It is not true, but I challenge anyone to say it is not a goal worth working for, end of quotes. Those words, those words reflect a worthy goal, a goal that is embedded in the Declaration of Independence, that are all potent and consequential. They are really potent and consequential words that reflect a core value of our democracy. And that is, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator for certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Notwithstanding the obvious slight to women, these words nevertheless represent a moral principle that we should, should strive to achieve. Unfortunately, in today's America, everyone is not treated equally. All we have to do is to look at issues surrounding mass incarceration or issues involving young black men identified erroneously as the perpetrators of crime only to be placed behind bars and bonds that are, have no chance of posting. Or the black single mother who is holding on to her job as a grocery clerk store because she can't afford childcare, or peaceful and law-abiding Muslims who have the right to go about their business in America without being accosted as terrorists. Or what about those individuals who wish to speak Spanish, to speak Spanish when shopping, without being verbally abused in communities of color where schools may lack sufficient resources and where decent job opportunities are scarce. Yes, I am talking about inner city communities where COVID-19 may rage in this apartment complexes, making social distancing a daily challenge. Our country has been a beacon to other countries, because our government is designed to protect rights, rights of everyone, especially the rights of those who are the least among me and those who do not have wealth or power. That's what we, as members of society, are supposed to work for. And it is a commitment that aligns with our core values and principles as a democracy. It is, in fact, the essence of the rule of law. Regrettably, however, the America I see today has been turned on its head by those who merely espouse democracy from a distance, those who pay lip service to the concept. In reality, they don't embrace the concept, the concept or values or ideals of a democracy. 
especially if it encroaches on what they view as their entitlements somewhere along the way. This segment of the population got the idea that their rights supersede those of others and norms, as well as the rule of law doesn't apply to them. To be sure, extremists from any direction is unacceptable in a democracy. The arrogance and ignorance that accompanies dogmatic inflexibility achieves nothing but divisiveness, hostility, hatred, and chaos. Far left, far right, it doesn't matter. They are not our better angels. Neither position as America's best interest at heart. And we, as a democratic nation, must condemn any tactics, any tactics that undermine the rule of law or our democratic values. Tactics that seek only to inflict wanton violence or destruction. However, I believe that the vast majority of Americans subscribe to our democratic principles and respect the rule of law. They simply want to live a good, safe, and decent life. They want their children to receive a good education. They want health insurance and employment that allows them to provide for their family. The desire for a good life for all has motivated thousands of Americans, goodwill of different ages, racial and ethnic backgrounds, to realize that all is not well in America. They recognize problems of institutional racism, individual racism, and inequality. They want meaningful changes. And yes, indeed, some of them have passionately exercised their constitutional right to protest against racial injustice and for police reforms in cities and towns across the nation. Yes, as is often the case, during these protest marches, bellicosity and unlawful behavior may be mistaken as conduct by the majority. It is not. We must never forget that history has taught us that there is always a reaction against those who advocate for systemic change. Many folks want to maintain the status quo, or even worse, revert back to days of Jim Crow when racial segregation was legal. They are agitators and fomenters of violence. They are often the loudest and most offensive. They have a keen self-interest and drowning out opinions that do not align with their views. These ideological vigilantes have a narrow mindset and only care about their agenda. They come in all sizes, shapes, political stripes and persuasions. And they always sing a chorus of criticism when a particular judicial ruling or legislative enactment rubs them the wrong way. The expression of criticism, different opinions or viewpoints, as harsh as it may be, is clearly acceptable because people have a First Amendment right to speak their mind. However, as witnessed by recent events, we now live in a time when the right to disagree has somehow morphed dangerously and exponentially into the right to threaten, harass, and intimidate at will even to the point of murdering a federal judge's young son in the family's home. This malignant and undemocratic phenomena is attributable in part to the speed and anonymity of social media, 
coupled with the ability of my malevolent actors to spread conspiracy, fear, discord, and lies. It is fueled by the deep hatred and division in our country, which seriously impedes construction dialogue among many people who disagree with one another. And finally, by the lack of a strong and disavowing response from those individuals who could, if they wanted to, douse the white fire that threatens to engulf us. This is what happens to a country when empathy and compassion are cast aside. Have we forgotten or have we completely refused to understand what it's like to walk in the shoes of people who do not look like us and whose experiences have been drastically different than our own? All of these factors have contributed to our current crisis and have resulted in the continuation of a toxic social and political discourse. A discourse that is contrary to our values as a democracy. Yes, America is in a state of crisis. And it would be naive not to consider in the context of this crisis issues regarding race, diversity, and inclusion, especially in light of the changing demographics of our country. Yes, the browning of America and the dehumanizing, hateful, and divisive rhetoric engulfing our country, which is primarily directed towards people of color, must be addressed. It must be addressed because it's relevant to our national character, to our values, and to our system of justice, diversity and inclusion. Two wonderful humanistic concepts are at odds with the current climate in our country because of the extensive polarization. They are at odds because of the perpetuation by certain groups of unfounded phobia, bigotry, and racial animus towards certain other groups. Yes, America is in a state of crisis. And the continuation of our democracy in which diversity and inclusion are accepted by everyone is an enduring challenge. This challenge is reflected when one considers the striding national dialogue concerning immigrants, white nationalism, white supremacy, the LGBTQ community, women, and people of color. These issues have clearly highlighted the fact that our nation is in the midst of a transformation a transformation that some folks refuse to accept. What we stand for and what we value as a nation of laws is being tested on a daily basis before our very eyes. The aforementioned issue speaks directly to the rule of law and what we value as a democracy. They speak to the moral fabric of our nation and highlights the fact that race relations, diversity, and inclusion are enduring challenges for our nation. Yes, America's legal, moral, and cultural crisis is on display. Our nation is divided by strongly held beliefs and opinions. Voters and politicians are polarized. Compromise has become an unacceptable concept. I'm reminded of the words uttered last year on July 14th when four Congress women of color, all of whom are US citizens, were told to go back 
to the countries they came from. I'm reminded that the despicable characterization of the wonderful city of Baltimore, Maryland as rat infested only serves to divide our nation. How do we unite our nation when some elected officials find it acceptable to spout racist rhetoric, advocate bigoted policies, and to stoke the prejudice and fears of others? It is undeniable that our core democratic values are under attack, values which includes ideal concepts such as liberty, equality, justice, diversity, inclusions, values which are designed to unite, not divide. And the polarization does not exist merely in the world of ideas. It has taken on an ugly reality. I'm reminded of the deplorable, repugnant, and sickening display of hatred, bigotry, and violence at the so-called the Unite the Right rally that occurred in Charlottesville, Virginia on August 12, 2017. Hate groups such as the Ku Klux Klan, neo-Nazis and white supremacists march waving Nazi flags, wearing helmets, carrying shields and firearms. They march with lit tiki torches, lit tiki torches in their hands, something which was reminiscent of KKK rallies and mob lynching, chanting racist slogans such as Jews will not replace them in blood and soil. Let us not forget that the leader of the free world being afforded with a golden opportunity to denounce these anti-American values following the tragedy of this rally. Chose not to condemn those espousing hate, bigotry, and racism. I say to our president, no, there are not very fine people on both sides of this debate. I'm reminded of the troubling increase in anti-Semitic incidents. None of us, none of us can forget the carnage that occurred at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh on October 27, 2018. But at least we think that this type of hateful, ideological, and ideology is graphically distant from us. I'm reminded of the vandalism of a synagogue in Newtown, Connecticut in August of last year. I'm reminded of the deadly attacks in Dayton, Ohio and El Paso, Texas. Attacks which occurred within less than 24 hours of each other. I'm reminded of the nearly 2,400 worded anti-immigrant manifesto posted online shortly before the El Paso attack. This disturbing screed read in part as follows, and I quote, this attack is in a response to the Hispanic invasion of Texas. They are the instigators, not me. I am simply defending my country from cultural and ethnic replacement brought on by an invasion. It makes no sense to keep on letting millions of illegal or legal immigrants flood into the United States and to keep the tens of millions that are already here. End of quote. Referring to immigrants as invaders is extreme rhetoric. It's a code word which suggests that immigrants are coming to America to replace white Americans. This troubling rhetoric echoes the rhetoric of the chief occupant of the White House and that of his supporters. Such provocative rhetoric 
in my opinion, exacerbates fear and contributes to a deadly societal fear of immigrants, especially Hispanic immigrants. Let there be no ambiguity that hate groups are determined to undermine and destroy the values that makes this country a beacon of hope for all. Domestic terrorism, hate, bigotry, racism, homophobia, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism are anathema to the values of our democracy and to precepts embedded in the Declaration of Independence and in our federal constitution. They have, they really have no place in our country. Yes, such demonstrations are a vivid reminder that America is in a state of crisis, especially when we have dissidents among us who view diversity and inclusion as initiatives that are tantamount to the great replacement or white genocide. The crisis is magnified when we have among us those who believe that white Christian ideals are threatened by ethnic diversity and multiculturalism. The crisis is exacerbated when we have some governmental leaders who demonstrate disrespect for the rule of law, our institutions, and the truth. Leaders who refuse to discuss critical issues, stoke division and trample on our constitutional liberties and are undermining our democratic values, equating the exercise of one's constitutional right to peacefully protest against racial injustice or the question governmental actions or policies as tantamount to a lack of patriotism undermines the rule of law and militates against our efforts to unite our nation. Yes, the challenges are real, especially when we are faced with an unbridled and disturbing public resurgence of hatred, bigotry, violence, and racism. This pathetic chasm reminds us that our nation continues to experience a racial, social, economic, political, and cultural divide of epic proportion. I'm reminded that our country continues to grapple with the many tentacles of race relations and the need for systemic reforms and an honest and frank discussion regarding race, the ideology of white nationalism, white supremacy, and the lingering effects of slavery is long overdue. <coughs> I am not so naive. However, to think that we can ever reason with or challenge the minds of hardened bigots, which rely on statutory enactments and our judicial system to deal with their illegal and invidious tactics. I do, however, believe that now is the time, that now is the time for people of goodwill who believe in justice and equality for all, who engage in such to engage in such a discussion, discussion on people among people of all color, a discussion on people of all faith and all ethnicities, people who believe that diversity and inclusions are essential values to the fabric of our nation. For if we are to have a diverse and inclusive society, that is celebrated and truly equal, that we must have consensus that the recognition, acceptance, and appreciation of these values enhances the richness of America. We should not, however, delude ourselves. The task is 
challenging for many reasons. There are many folks, some of whom are in positions of power and influence, who simply refuse to accept the reality of the changing demographics of our country. Yes, our nation is in the midst of a major racial and ethnic shift. The United States population is becoming more racially and ethnically diverse. <clears throat> yes, someday. Someday soon, surely much sooner than most people realize, white Americans will become a minority group. Long before that day arrives, the presumption that the typical United States citizen is someone who traces his or her descent in a direct line to Europe will be a relic of history. I posit that by the time students in our high schools reach midlife, their diverse ethnic experience in the classroom will be echoed in neighborhoods and workplaces throughout the United States to a far greater extent than it is today. This racial and ethnic shift in America has and will continue to alter everything in our society, from politics and education to industry to values and culture. Therefore, we as individuals and members of the legal profession must prepare ourselves to deal with this ever-shifting trend in the racial and ethnic complexion of our nation and the economic, social, and political realities of this phenomena. So against this realistic trend, it is clear that we have work to do. The continuous troubling, polarizing, and divisive rhetoric by hate groups and some national leaders must be denounced. Yes, those of us who are committed to the rule of law and our democratic values are facing an enduring challenge, a daunting challenge. The challenge is real. The challenge is enduring. Those of us who are committed to the role of law, principles of diversity and inclusion must create an environment, work or otherwise, that is better and more reflective and responsive to a culturally diverse population. We must respond to the challenge by doubling down, by facing those challenges with a new sense of urgency and commitment. We must rid ourselves of the many biases and preconceived notion about those among us who are different. And to be sure, we cannot honor our democratic values unless we recognize that diversity and inclusion with all of its challenges are topics that must be addressed. They must be addressed because their importance to the future of our nation cannot be underestimated. As Americans and as America races towards a future, where so-called minorities will be the majority and more marginalized groups make their voices heard, our nation as well as our government on every level must double down on its efforts to recognize, accept, and embrace this inevitable occurrence. We have a responsibility to reach out and embrace racial and ethnic groups, sexual and gender minorities, and people with disabilities who are vastly underrepresented at every level and across every stratum of our nation. Such disproportional representation can lead to the development of policies and procedures that fail to sufficiently encompass the vast array of knowledge, experience, and perspective of these groups. Yes, honoring 
our democratic values and respecting the rule of law are enduring challenges that require more than just lip service. Yes, the legal profession and our judiciary have significant roles to play in resolving the crisis in America. These institutions should represent and mirror the population they serve, especially since their mission is grounded in respect for the rule of law and our democratic values. Our law schools should serve as a fertile ground for acceptance of diversity and promoting inclusion. They should serve as a model for appreciating, valuing, and understanding the richness that flows from diversity and the intrinsic learning that flows from inclusion of students from different cultural backgrounds and perspectives. We in the legal profession must confront the injustices that leads so many in our society to cry out for justice system that works fairly for everyone. We as lawyers, advocates, and judges must unambiguously say that we are wholeheartedly embrace this obligation. As members of the legal profession who have sworn to uphold our fundamental constitutional values, we shall not rest until the promise of equal justice for all is for all people a living truth. Yes, that is not the time to be silent. Silence and, and action are the fertile soil in which hate and intolerance take root. It is time to not only expect action from others, but to demand action from yourself as we continue our efforts to resolve the crisis in America. I am hopeful that all good right-thinking folks will make it a lifelong quest to actively promote diversity and inclusion, to try to heal the division in our nation and to reaffirm their commitment to the rule of law and our democratic values. Yes, that is my hope. And to do otherwise would run counter to and, and impede the realization of the noble principles which should be an inherent part of our national creed of our nation and our legal system, to do justice for all. Yes, justice for all a core value, if accepted and respected, can serve to unite a divided America. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, justice for all implicates our humanity and goes straight to the heart of the quality of justice we should want for all. This is the main artery. So consider my message this afternoon as we move forward as a country in an attempt to resolve the crisis in America as a call to duty. And in responding to that call, may we reach a point where we refuse to judge people based on their ethnic background or the color of their skin. Such considerations are irrelevant and repugnant. I know. I know because some of my best friends do not look like me. We must absolutely absolutely must look beyond the superficial and unite around the common bonds of humanity that we all share. Color be damned. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Harper. That was uh, very timely and uh, very informative uh, talk and certainly gives us a lot uh, to think about in terms of how we participate as uh, members of the bar, or bench, or in any other walk of life uh, in making our system uh, tend and trend towards more equality and democracy and protecting uh, the values that we do uh, have and uh, that we aspire to have uh, in our uh, democracy. Well, that uh, I'd like to uh, thank you again. Uh, it's been a, a 
great honor to have you uh, take the time out to, to talk to us here uh, at this reunion. And uh, thank you again for your time and your great uh, preparation and delivery of your uh, thoughts to us. Thank you. Uh, and uh, now I'd like to uh, introduce everyone to uh, our new Dean, uh, Dean Ebony Nelson, uh, who would like to say a few words. Dean Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Sinetis, for that kind introduction. Good afternoon, alumni and everyone. It is such a pleasure to join you today as you celebrate your law school reunion. I am honored to have the opportunity to serve as Dean of UConn Law, and I look forward to meeting and working with all of you during my tenure as Dean. Thank you so much, Justice Harper, for your kind words and inspiring remarks. I greatly appreciate your charge to all of us to do what we can to protect the rule of law in our communities and country as we strive to create a more just and equitable society. Indeed, this is crucial to our mission here at the law school. As a legal institution, excuse me, a legal educational institution, we have a responsibility to teach our students and others about the rule of law and how laws impact people's lives, both positively and negatively on a daily basis. As we spoke when we met, and as you mentioned during your remarks, we must never forget the importance of humanity and empathy as we examine and work within our legal systems. To quote Brian Stevenson, who authored our 1L Common Read book this year, Just Mercy, a story of justice and redemption, I quote, each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done, end quote. I have been inspired by your commitment to demonstrate such humanity, both inside and outside, the courtroom, in your respectful treatment of those who appear before you, and in your tireless, dedicated service to members of our community. At the law school, we help to instill these important values in our students through our outstanding clinical offerings, in which I'm sure many of you participated. And we also plan to include discussions of humanity and empathy as we develop a new center this year focused on criminal justice and community safety. As Dean, I'm committed to enhancing institutional excellence by elevating diversity, equity, inclusion, and community at the law school. And I look forward to partnering with all of you in this important endeavor. I thank you all for attending today, and I thank you for your dedication and commitment and service to the law school. I look forward to the opportunity to welcome all of you back in person to our beautiful campus, hopefully sooner rather than later. Until then, please be safe and please do not hesitate to contact me if I can be of assistance in any way. Thank you all so much for attending today. Um, hello everyone, I wanna just echo the comments of our Dean. Um, and say thank you to all of you for attending, for participating in this powerful address. Justice Harper, uh, as president of the Law School Alumni Association, I want to extend my deepest gratitude to you, not only for your presence and your attendance today, but for the power of your words. Um, I've had the privilege of speaking or hearing you speak in person, um, and uh, nothing failed to come through in a virtual presentation. And so thank you for the power of your message and the power of your words today. Um, this afternoon or this evening, we will be uh, having a virtual celebration um, and a toast to all of you to celebrate your reunion. We understand that this is certainly not the reunion that we originally all anticipated, but hope you'll join us uh, for some remarks from our Dean as well as a virtual toast uh, this evening. So thank you for joining us for this presentation um, and we look forward to seeing you this evening. Thank you. <laughs>